That is incredible. That is selling seats in the House of Lords, in the legislature. That is actually just making corruption. And we tolerate that. The law also allows these groups who are abroad to act as third parties and give money to British politics. So actually, far from making it harder to make for foreign influence of British politics and foreign donations, the government has made it easier. We see it in, in America, we see it in the UK in respect to how dark money operates. So yeah, again, I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, no, it's a huge issue, I think. I think it's a massive issue. I think it's probably the biggest issue. I, I wrote for this, again, on my Substack before Christmas, about basically the British government brought in, uh, the Conservative government, a couple of months ago, a series of quite sweeping changes to how elections are done in the UK. A guy who'd previously been in business with the head of Saudi secret intelligence and a Danish gun rudder. There was aspects of this story that felt like a thriller. Hey man, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much for having me on. I've wanted to get you on for a while. Having read your book over the festive period, I was just blown away by your insights and kind of the work that you'd uncovered and continue to uncover. I noticed recently you've been back in, in the news and bits and pieces with, with your work as well. And yeah, it's, I just wanted to share your insight with our audience. So here we are. So thank you very much for, for the time. But before we dive into it, let's start with who you are, what you do and why. Yeah, so my name is Peter Gagan. Um, yeah, the book you refer to is called Democracy for Sale, Dark Money, Dark Politics. It came out in 2020 and, and was kind of a, a, it was kind of like coming together of a lot of investigations I've been doing for a few years before that, looking at the role of, of money and power in British politics. And, and at the time, I was the investigations editor at the website Open Democracy. Then I became the editor in chiefs there, and now I work. I, I, have a, I have a bunch of different hats at the moment. I run a Substack called Democracy for Sale, where I do a lot of stories about this sort of work, and um, it's a big passion of mine. And I also work as an investigative reporter for the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, the OCCRP. Amazing, and yeah, like today seems like a perfect time to have this conversation. I've noticed in the news that the UK have slipped you to twentieth place in respect to corruption. So, yeah, let's maybe start there. Yeah, this is quite this is quite important. So this is Transparency International, who are an international, very respected anti-corruption organization. They've got a UK chapter. And every year in January they bring out this thing, the CPI, the kind of the, the global perceptions of corruption. And Britain is now Britain last year slipped from thirteenth to eighteenth, which was its lowest placing, and now it's gone even lower, it's now to twentieth. And the main reason behind for this is, is the PPE contracts, which actually was an issue I was reporting pretty early. It was a story I kind of was reporting from kind of pretty almost the start of the pandemic and that's been the big thing obviously there's been a lot of news about that we know a lot of uh Michelle Moan's been in the news but there's other there's other people too around the kind of there's the VIP lane for COVID contracts etc and I think what the Transparency International uh survey and the finding I think it chimes a lot of people's experiences I think it's not something that's come out of the blue I think in many respects like I wrote last week on my sub stack and it was also in the times about the failure to appoint Richard Sunak's failure to appoint an anti-corruption champion in parliament for the last 18 months mm. and it's just quite clear you know there's, there's, this is a government for all manner of reasons that seems to have a very very lax attitude when it comes to issues of corruption so in, in some ways it's it's, a, it's the right kind of us to be talking but it almost feels like if any week over the last two or three years and something would have been happening that week that we could have pinned this conversation to as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I guess like in respect to the wider picture, it's something that's that's been evolving over a number of years. Obviously, when, when we first started to see a coalition of government, it wasn't that long ago that I recall David Cameron actually saying that lobbying is going to be the next great scandal waiting to happen. And since, since then, we've had an awful lot of evolutions, both in the UK and wider afield, but yeah, like we can't really have this conversation without mapping back to the beginnings of Brexit and and how kind of Brexit evolved and I guess like also the DUP and EIG and it's it's kind of one of the beginnings in respect to the, the your book Democracy for Sale. So love to get your insights on that. Yeah, so it was really interesting that the, the entire book, like the entire all the work, most a lot of the work I've been doing over the last coming on now for six years i didn't think i would ever do it wouldn't something that i i thought i was an investigative journalist i used to work for channel four to make dispatches i set up a thing in scotland called the ferris which is an investigative cooperative a lot of investigative work but money and politics was something i really didn't report on all that much and i was actually working as a stringer as a freelance journalist for the irish times back in the middle of 2016 when i my editor in time sent me up to sunderland to write a story on um uh, kind of just before the Brexit referendum, what people are feeling, what's the, taking the temperature in some of um, A place probably not, not that far away from where you are now, Peter. And I was sent up there, and um, on my when I was there, I noticed this um, advert in the Metro, the newspaper, a big wraparound advert, that vote leave, take back control, which is the official leave slogan. 
And on the back, it had a little crest of the DUP, and it said, sponsor, this ad was brought to you by the Democratic Union Party. And I said that was very interesting, because I used to work as a journalist in Northern Ireland, so I was aware of the DUP. I knew that they didn't have any voters in Sunderland. I knew that they weren't, they weren't the kind of party that normally spends large sums of money outside of Northern Ireland. But I also knew that under a loophole that dated back from the Troubles, political donations in Northern Ireland were kept secret. So unlike the rest of the UK, we didn't know who gave money to Northern Irish parties. And so I ended up publishing an investigation about, the, about nine months later into the DUP's uh, Brexit spending. I found out that they'd received almost half a million pounds. They'd been funneled through a very shadowy thing called the Constitutional Research Council, which sounds really grand, but was actually just one guy in a, ter- in a, in a semi-detached house in the outskirts of Glasgow, a guy who'd previously been in business with the head of Saudi secret intelligence and a Danish gun rudder. There were aspects of this story that felt like a thriller. But it kind of got me thinking and looking into how money is spent in our politics. And you know, we subsequently, actually, over the next years, and I wasn't the only person reporting on we found out more about the role of organizations like Cambridge Analytica. We found out that Vote Leave, the official Leave campaign, and Dominic Cummings had broken electoral law. We found out a lot. But actually, also what happened was almost nothing changed, actually. And if anything, the opposite happened, where uh, in the last couple of years, the, the, the Conservative government has actually brought in legislation that means our electoral watchdog is no longer independent of government, which is part which will also contribute to the kind of corruption index ranking. Um, and the, uh, there's, there's actually even less oversight of money in politics than there was back when I started writing that book. Yeah, exactly. And it's not too long ago that Rishi Sunak was standing on the steps of number 10, ushering essentially the knowledge principles of accountability, transparency, and 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 more and where we are today it just seems like there's a doubling down rather than a a a a hold of accountability and transparency in respect to what's taking place it's it, it's it's funny because you also mentioned about how some of these shady organizations ultimately allow for like third party funding but it's it's an evo- it's an evolution that's occurred for quite a while in respect to the the number of years that have passed, like I remember people like Liam Fox's Atlantic Bridge, for example. Yeah, like let, let's use the opportunity to talk about that. Yeah, so in some ways, this is this is the thing as well. I think the the issues in Britain, some days they can feel very you, and you've got Rishi Sunak standing up talking about integrity, and it does feel ridiculous. Like like the story I, I mentioned, I did last week about the fact that he hasn't replaced someone, he hasn't replaced John Penrose, the anti-corruption champion, eighteen months after he resigned because Boris Johnson had broken the Ministerial Code or Party Gate and refused to do anything about it. So Sunak hasn't done anything, but in some ways he is actually off a piece. You mentioned David Cameron and his quiet word about lobbying. Probably the biggest lobbying scandal of the last 20 Greens. years was David Cameron and Greensill. Yeah. There was this kind of incredible hutzpah to some of these people, frankly, where they say, oh yes, yes, we must do something about this. But actually, far from, not only do they do nothing, but they actually get involved in, in uh, the worst of the scandals themselves. And yeah, you mentioned, uh, there's a, there's a part, probably about half a chapter of my book actually talks about the, the Liam, Liam Fox Atlantic Bridge, which was back when Liam Fox was, was the foreign secretary. And he effectively had a lobbying, his, his, his private office was effectively been run by a lobbyist who's a peer, who used to come with him on uh, trips. And what was really interesting about this was at the time Liam Fox had a, had a charitable, charitable uh, company called Atlantic Bridge that was all about, as the name suggests, developing links across the Atlantic between um, neoconservative think tanks and what we call um, kind of Tupton Street in the UK and the kind of the Conservative Party in the UK. And some of these UK, US think tanks have now become very pop- famous, people like the Heritage Foundation and others, because they're very much involved with, Dominic, uh, with Donald Trump and have been very strong supporters of Dominic, Donald Trump for a long time. Um, but what what Fox was essentially doing was setting up this uh, this supposed charity that had huge links into his office and was being run by a uh, by a lobbyist who was who was also accompanying to meetings. So it was it, remarkably actually it was a scandal that I think it was actually less. It, had that scandal happened almost ten years later, Fox would have stayed in a job. But I think yeah. the nature of the beast, this was 2010, 11, 12, when there actually probably was some element of sense of, and, and the Liberal Democrats were the coalition partners for the, for the Conservatives, so I think they, there was probably some aspect of that too. And Cameron had talked about how lobbying needed to be reformed, so Liam Fox did go. But it's worth remembering that the legislation David Cameron brought in, he then eventually brought in lobbying legislation, is, I would argue, worse than having no legislation at all. Because if we had no lobbying legislation at the moment, people would say, we have to have lobbying legislation. The Labour Party would put it on their manifesto. It would be a constant issue. Instead, we have this awful lobbying legislation, which means that, for example, in-house lobbyists don't have to register as lobbyists. So 
If David Cameron, who's working for Greensill, goes to meet somebody, because he's working for Greensill, he doesn't have to register as a lobbyist, which to anybody is absolutely barring. It's, it's ridiculous. But there's a, the, the lobbying register captures only a fraction of the lobbying that goes on. Um, um, I actually just wrote a Substack post today about Dominic Grab, who um, Dominic Grab had been an interesting story in the FT, kind of a slightly funny story in the FT back in September, where the FT had got hold of Dominic Grab's CV, which a, a consultancy firm was punting around the city of London to see if they could get him a new a, a job. He wanted a job in consultancy. Uh, and, you know, kind of talking up what a great guy he was, uh, even included his karate skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it was all what he would do after, because he's standing down for election. I'm sure the fact that he's standing down that doesn't do the fact that he's only got about a 2,000 seat, a major- uh, 2,000 vote majority in the seat. And lo and behold, I noticed that just a couple of weeks ago, Dominic Grab has now become a, a consultant, a strategic global consultant for a thing called Appian Capital, which is a big mining interest. He's been paid $150,000 a year for it. And that's, again, this issue that I think begs a lot. People will go, well, how is somebody able to do that job and also be an MP at the same time? And, and if you look at what the, um, under the lobbying register, he, he's not allowed to be personally involved in lobbying uh, contacts he made in government for two years after he leaves office. And um, if you look at David Cameron, David Cameron joined Green Cell exactly two years. I think it was almost two years to the day after he left office. So being, this legislation, it's, it's really, really poor. And the fact that we have it is almost, in some ways, worse than not having it at all. Well, definitely, it's it's paper thin. I've, I've worked in audit for many a year before. I kind of do what I do today. Looking at some of the things that we see today, I'm like, well, this is just so blatant. Like the conflicts of interest, even at our base level, is just there to be kind of dumbfounded by what we end up seeing. But I think it's the ability to distract people. We we talked about funding a little bit, and but there's there's a lot of parallels between people that fund groups in america and the, the more more nowadays because they keep on leaning more to the right than center right but the funding of groups in america and also the funding of groups in the uk there's a lot of similarities there but then equally that ability for that whole dead cat scenario just have a scandal after a scandal after a scandal after a scandal and lose people in in the depths of the narrative to ultimately just allow for the ushering in of just absolute blatant wrongdoing. Naomi Klein's touched upon this in things like disaster capitalism, but this whole Brexit influence game has really changed the game of the political landscape. So again, I'd love to get your take on that too. Yeah, I think that's, and the phrase you use of the Brexit, the Brexit influence game, it, it, that's also the, the title of a chapter of my book, but it comes from an investigation that my colleagues, my wonderful colleagues at Greenpeace on Earth, the investigative unit slash Greenpeace did back in 2019. And they basically stoned, they did a sting operation against the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is the oldest kind of libertarian think tank in the UK. It doesn't declare its donors. And uh, Greenpeace, a Greenpeace journal was posed as a someone who had an interest in, U, in in the meat industry, in US meat, and wants to get access to the UK. And you had undercover, you had the head of, the, of Greenpeace, of the Institute of Economic Affairs, saying basically for £30,000, we'll write a report that will say the things that it'll agree with what you think, basically. You won't get to write the report, but it'll agree with what you think. And we get you a meeting with a cabinet minister, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of, lots of access. And in, it, in that meeting, uh, in that undercover, Mark Little, who was just departed as the, the head of the Institute of Economic Affairs, says that we're in the Brexit influencing game. And, it's, and I do, that's probably a central thesis in my book, is I do think Brexit did change. It kind of supercharged a lot of stuff that was happening. You saw these sorts of groups that were quite fringe, like the IEA, quite fringe, seen as a bit cranky. Yes, they got money probably from corporations, some Tory donors, etc. They didn't say where it came from. Yes, they had access into the media, but often seen as a bit, kind of, a bit of a cranky out- outfit. It's not that important. Suddenly, they became really important, partly because they were subscribing to the narrative that Brexit was great. So they were, there was something cabinet ministers, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, David Davis and others, could stand up and say, no, it's not just us. There's a great report here from the Institute of Economic Affairs that agrees with all the things we want to say. So that was really useful. It provided a kind of a fig leaf, um, but also incredible access, as we, as we then saw with Liz Truss. By the time then Liz Truss becomes Prime Minister in, 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 in September 2022, she basically brings in a huge swathes of these Tupton Street, uh, people from Tupton Street, people from this tight network of right-wing think tanks, okay, none of whom declared their funding. The other chief of staff has got links into it. Her head of policy used to be the Taxpayers Alliance. All of uh, T- Tim Montgomery, the prominent conservative commentator, says, you're well done, the IEA, when Liz Truss becomes prime minister. You guys incubated her, and they kind of say they're all backslapping each other on Twitter. 
of course now they can't uh, they can't uh, quickly enough kind of say there's nothing to do with us Liz Trust wasn't our fault etc 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 but it's quite remarkable I think the, the level of influence like I did a story recently on my sub stack about the Institute of Economic Affairs had appeared on the British media 5,000 times in the last year yeah. it's incredible amounts of access for really quite small amounts of money and I remember I was writing my book and Gosho Beb, who was a Tory M, uh, Tory minister, a Welsh Tory MP, uh, he said to me, look, if you had a quarter of a million pounds and you wanted to influence British politics, I, he said, I wouldn't give it to a political party, I'd give it to a think tank. You'd get much more influence from, from that, from a think tank you would have from anything else. Yeah, definitely. And you see, people look at things like Question Time and you also, also always see the panel and you understand from one perspective, it's all, always that viewpoint on bias, but then ultimately it's is putting experts with I don't know, ideologies. And also the the hidden layers. If you actually look at some of the underlying titles, it's like political commentator, whether it's your head of policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And it doesn't make sense to have this kind of mirage when actually they stand for and represent something far different. So it's it's interesting, that piece. And, and also, I think structurally and system-wise, the UK system is built on principles, but not built on real policy. So this... It's it's very brittle at the foundations, so I don't think we actually have a system that is up to speed with the realities that it faces. I think that's really true. I think there's a couple of things that go on. You've got you've got in terms of like people not understanding where these people come from. Like it's most people do not know who the Institute of Economic Affairs are, and they sound like the Institute of Fiscal Studies or something. They sound really venerable. When I started doing this work, I never knew any of these groups were. I only got interested in them actually when I saw the Legatum Institutes back in 2017 maybe or 2018 published a paper and it was about the Northern Irish border which is where I'm, where I'm from I talked about it was just a terrible piece of work it was solutions to the Northern Irish border and one of them was like having like uh, basically like blimps looking after the border it was like it's crazy stuff and I was like who are these people how are they getting the access and that's how I end up writing about them but I think more generally we do have a structure and a political structure that's really really open uh, to abuse and part of the reason it's open to abuse, I think, is this kind of weird perception amongst people in Westminster. And actually, for a long time amongst political journalists, I think it's slowly starting to change, but not as much as I would like it to, that everything is fine. There's nothing to see here. British politics is all totally above board. Anyone who's saying otherwise is a bit of a conspiracy theorist. Um, I think that the, the COVID and the COVID contracts has changed that a bit, but not as much as it should. Yeah, definitely. It, but I think also that ability to influence, you know, traditionally... If you mentioned about giving money to think tanks rather than political parties, but that ability to work through a third party to take away ownership and accountability, but still have the level of influence there, we we see it in in America, we see it in the UK in respect to how dark money operates. So, yeah, again, I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, no, it's a huge issue. I think I think it's a massive issue. I think it's probably the biggest issue. I, I wrote for this again on my Substack before Christmas about basically the British government brought in uh, the Conservative government. A couple of months ago, a series of quite sweeping changes to to electoral uh, to how elections are done in the UK. They did it through statutory instrument, which means it didn't have to be voted through Parliament. They did it with almost no debate. But what they did was they increased significantly the amount of money that you can give anonymously to British politics, and um, and the amount of money things like unincorporated associations, which sounds complicated, but basically it's they're kind of they're they're groups of people who don't even have to file accounts can give to British politics. So we're seeing this potential to give more dark money to British politics. It's never been as high. And there's so many ways to do it. You can basically, somebody with a, a wife and two kids can effectively give £50,000 anonymously to British politics now. And £50,000, it's worth reminding, is the is the cost of the leaders group of Conservative donors. So if you give £50,000 to the Conservative Party every, a year, you get to have dinner with Boris Johnson and senior cabinet ministers four times a year. That's incredible access for, for you know, £50,000. That's really a huge access. And a lot of people would, a lot of people would go, they'd be surprised to find out they don't know this happens. There's no minutes taken of these meetings. So we have this potential in the UK to use particularly third parties, and they've done nothing about this. So the government has changed all these. It's not as, it'd be different if the government just said, we're not doing anything with electoral le- election law legislation. We're not going to touch it. No, they've not done anything about the things that they've been warned about. So the, um, the Commission on Standards and Public Life, which is, run by Lord Evans, the former head of MI5. So he's not a pretty established figure. He's not some kind of, he's not on the fringes. He brought out, they brought out a report about 18 months ago that said, look, you need to do a lot of things to stop dark money in British politics. Stop foreign influence, including closing these loopholes around unincorporated associations. 
The government then brought in an elections act, an elections bill and an elections act that did nothing for these issues, did nothing about unincorporated association, did nothing about foreign influence, but did mean that you had to bring voter ID to be able to vote, and did also take away the independence of the electoral commission. Now the government has increased the amount you can spend it on, honestly, increased thresholds for donations without having to be disclosed, and it's done nothing about the actual problems that we see. So no, it's it's really, really bad. You can see actually just today in the Times, there's an interesting report, kind of slightly buried in the Times, about how the Conservative Party is now lining up. Because one of the things that the Elections Act did was actually give the vote to about 3 million British people who live abroad uh, and hadn't actually bothered to keep up their registration. So now you can indefinitely live abroad, uh, live abroad to vote. Which seems to be based on the, the Conservatives' assumption that these people would vote for the Tories. I'm, I'm not actually sure that's true. But there's a report in the Times today that says that the Conservatives have hired people to actually kind of go and mobilise these groups so they can act as their proxies and vote on their behalf in the UK. There are also the, the law also allows these groups who are abroad to act as third parties and give money to British politics. So actually, far from making it harder to make uh, to, to for foreign influence and British politics and foreign donations, the government has made it easier. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a really crazy situation. Yeah, definitely. And, and that ability, historically, when, I think it's like a 15-year removal of the 15-year limit in respect to yeah. Xbox. That was... Historically, something that if, say, I, I'm from Cumbria, right? I grew up in, in and around Carlisle. So if I had lived abroad and came back, then I'd really have to go and vote in my constituency. But what they're doing at the moment is hiring voting coordinators to speak directly to these people and say, oh, we would like you to vote in this area, which just by chance is, has a very slim Tory majority. But we, we it's just, a, to me, it looks like a desperation in respect to a cling to power. And at the same, you're bringing in things like voter IDs and that restricts people. I think it restricts about 2 million people that reside in the UK to vote because they don't have respective ID. So that's going to be a challenge. And we mentioned about the dark money element, but also the ability to change the sums of money that you can spend on elections. Like beforehand, it was about 19 million. Now they've upped it to 35. So I, I personally, I'm quite fearful. I, I feel a big wave in the UK of a desire for change. People are like so sick and tired of this nonsense. But you kind of see also a doubling down of a party kin to kind of 97 when they were so desperate to remain in power, it just look. It looks like the British people have a choice between a party out of ideas and out of solutions and out of anything, on a willful desperation to cling on to power, and also opposition to that is the ability to enact change. And I just hope, as a as an eternal optimist, that British people actually do take the the route to change. Because if we don't, we, we could end up in a very dark situation. We haven't touched upon it yet, but we we mentioned briefly about things like Cambridge Analytica and digital influential behavior like maybe it's a good opportunity to dive into into the realities of how digital is influencing people's reality it was very interesting i think this election is going to be fascinating to see around that to see like there was there was some if you look at like facebook the facebook ad library where there you can see how much people have spent on ads on facebook which really is about still by the only bit of transparency you can get on the internet about where um, Google has an ad library, but it, it wipes every three months. You can actually have three months of ad spend. And it's interesting, you know, the Tories have been pushing Rissy Sunak, spending quite a lot of money. We saw at the last general election, a lot of, um, we saw the last general election, a lot of like kind of third party campaigners popping up. I reported on them a lot and spending pounds, actually total hundreds of thousands of pounds. I think it was about 700,000 pounds in total on Facebook, Facebook ads, declaring nothing. Hadn't declared a single donation, so you're like, well, where did all this money come from? And nothing, they, they disappear into the ether, and nothing is done. So there's, there is that history, and, and and so it'll be very interesting to see what happens in this election. The Conservatives are working with Isaac Levido, who was involved in the last election campaign, and this work. Remember, like the Conservatives ran a really dirty election campaign in 2018. Yeah. Online, they did things like they rebranded their Twitter account as a fact-checking account during the live debate, and this is all really quite grim. But how much this is an impact on voters is, is is very still very much a moot point when it comes to academics. In terms of, I think in close elections and stuff is probably quite significant. I think in, I I'm going to be very surprised the next general election is close. Maybe I'm wrong. I just feel like the Conservative Party are really running and emptied out. So maybe it won't be it won't be that significant. But I think it has a, a tonal issue as well. I think in terms of winner, even if it doesn't change people's votes, I think it sets a tone for debate and it sets an expectation for debate and discussion, which I think is very low and is actually genuinely really damaging. It can be damaging to democracy. So I think there's a huge question, there's still massive questions about like what, what some of those debates can look like in the UK and in the US as well. 
But fundamentally, you still have so little oversight. As mm. I say, the Facebook ad library, which is the guts of five years old, is the only thing that we have that tells us about how parties are campaigning online. And, and I'm also very interested what, 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 what are the motivations? Who's working along with these people? Who are the, who are the PR people around this? Who are the consultants? What kind of messaging that's been created? The architecture of messaging that's created around this. I think that has the, we've actually seen it. We're seeing it at the moment with the, with the green agenda. You know, I wrote a big piece of the times that we supplement on this recently about the kind of pushback against net zero. And what you're seeing, what we've seen there is like this campaign, this very, this campaign in, in Uxbridge in the by election back in the summer, uh, which the Tories just about managed to win, on the back of which, you know, very strong anti ULEs, very strong anti, and then behind like an anti net zero. And that does move the dial. Like it, the concern, it looks like the neighbor about to, to ditch their 28 million, billion pound green energy, um, uh, green investment commitment. And so that's the issue. It's not necessarily all just about winning votes. I think it's also about mm-hmm. narrative and narrative change. And also, I think that's the most important, or that can be the most significant aspect of some of this money and power. It mightn't shift in an election in terms of getting some of the vote differently, but it can shift the priorities and the narrative. And often that's that's winning, actually, more than the seats in the legislature. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the challenges being people's attention spans, like there was a report a little while ago by Microsoft that kind of articulated the fact that we used to have attention spans about like 12 to 14 seconds. Now it's dropped down to eight and reducing on a on a year-by-year basis. And that ability to take out a snippet and go, well, have you seen this shot? Have you seen this reel? Have you seen this like tweet? Averse to looking at the the depths of what's really going on, because I look at things and I think this year this year the coming election is going to be one that's uh, that's ultimately won and lost by the utilization of technology. So hmm. where you see bits and pieces that are coming out now, the ability to digitally manipulate people into scenarios that they weren't even present within through the utilizers of of technology to mimic voices, mimic imagery, whatever it may be. People will look at that and go, have you seen this? Has this really gone on? And and that ability to kind of sway votes is, I think it's going to be something that people haven't really ever dealt with before. Because, yeah, back to that element about the the, the dead cat, if you throw something to distract away, people are just constantly curious by the distraction. So, yeah, I'm quite worried, if I'm honest. And I know at the moment, Labour have got maybe about a 27-point lead over the Conservatives. But if you look at previous elections in the run-up to yeah. um, at least like 10, 15 years, there's always been this bump of, an, of a nine-point swing and for the Conservatives up until an, a, an election is run. So I, I don't think it'll be anywhere near the 27 points that we see at the moment. I think it'll be quite close, but ultimately it comes down to the fact that and just ask people for what it is they they want from a nation do you want to be values based do you want to have like optimism do you want to have hope for your children do you want to have a bit more of a progressive future or do you want to see the perpetuation of what we've seen over the last 14 years and yeah i want to see i really want to see change but yeah whether we'll get there is it's it's down to people at the moment who have an ability to vote yeah i i do worry by the depths that the conservatives how just desperate they are to cling on to power because it's it's a bit of a slippery slope you talked about it in your book but the trump before the trump for example mm. and, victor, and victor oban people need it's it's about having that holistic viewpoint and looking further afield in respect to voter suppression in trinidad and tobago the uh, atlas network in argentina and the pe- people like victor oban and how that they remain in power rather than just simply rise to power and yeah like i'd love to get your take on all of those bits as well. Yeah, well, it, I think it's 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 you know the, that's that's what's in some ways so kind of slightly frightening about the, the era we're in. I think that's and what's fascinating. I, I write a bit. There's quite a lot about Orban in my book actually, and he's been, since you know, the book is now a few years old. But he's been some ways one of the reasons that I haven't written a sequel to it. Like, I think actually it's still horribly current that book. A lot of things that are in it are still just as relevant. I think I'd probably end up saying the same thing all over again. What's fascinating with Orban, if you look, take a character like he, he was a he was a he was a bright young thing in Hungary in the eighties and at the time of the kind of towards the end of, of communism, he actually had a, a Soros scholarship to go to Oxford. He came back. He was kind of seen as a liberal, a liberal with us both politically and economically, kind of free markety, like kind of social liberal. Um, he he set up he headed Fidesz this this party. They actually won power in Hungary on a kind of social and a kind of liberal ticket. Then they lost power, and when he, got out of, when he lost power, he went to the socialists. He was like, "Look, I'm, this must never happen again." 
Uh, if I can get, I want to get back into environmental staying power. And what he did was he hired a PR consultant. So he hired um, a, a guy called Finkelstein uh, who used to work for um, uh, used to work for Richard Nixon. And Finkelstein basically said to him, "Look, what you need is an enemy." You're, and they came upon George Soros. The only is a consultant. So he hired were, were mainly uh, were Jewish people, but and Soros is, is clearly a, a kind of anti-Semitic trope, but. They hired, they, that was the idea. We're going to focus on George Soros and, and basically and anti-Semitism, and that's going to be your message. Uh, and that's what Sor- that's what Orban has done ever since, incredibly successfully. It's kind of nature of his politics. And you're seeing it in other places. I'm actually seeing some of it here. You know, I reported at the NACON conference last year, the National Conservative Conference, where a number of government ministers spoke at a platform where it was people from Fidesz, from Orban's party, from the far right of the, the Republican Party in the state. The people pushing this very nativist message, a very authoritarian message. Um, and what we, I think we should call them as part of what we call the populist radical right. And the way in which this is a kind of the, the nationalist international, if that makes sense, it's kind of global alliance of nationalists. The way in which they're channeling messages and able to, I think also... They're, they've been very adept at creating, you know, at, at, at PR. They've been very adept at creating sculpting messages, very adept at using the digital tools to, to, to shape those messages, and also very adept at using their money and using that kind of the option, uh, of using that to influence uh, what's happening. Now, I'm fascinated. I've become really interested at the moment in the Farmers' Party stuff that's happening across the uh, across Europe, including my own country, Ireland. And the first, probably the first big Farmers' Party was this Dutch Farmers' Party, which topped the polls uh, last year. And I think it was local elections in Holland that's very influential. You know, report that that party was set up by a PR agency. This is and that's really important. I think this this aspect at which democracy and uh, democracy and, and, and capitalism are actually not working hand in hand. The, the extent to which vested interests can use the tools, what should be the tools of democracy, to corrupt it is huge. Definitely, it, it's all about destabilization, in my view. Because if you look, I remember we we talked about 2019 being quite a, a horrendous election cycle. But in around that period of time, there was this famous report that was getting a lot of traction, but didn't really end up with any any action plans to to mitigate some of the areas that were noted. And that was the the Russian report. It was it was flagged during the election, and there was also I remember the committee members coming out after the fact and doing a, a press conference just to articulate just how serious this is. And then we look at how the Conservatives have been funded. People don't really see that hand in glove relationship between yeah dark money like how it, how it comes to comes to play and how it ultimately it has the ability to form the narrative and and change the the whole outlook of a nation just by destabilization yeah no i think that i think that's that's the aspect of it i think there's also a boiling frog thing that's happened in the uk over the last few years where like We've had succession after succession of thought look back to the Owen Patterson affair, which is just it is it is absolutely remarkable. What you had was a former government minister who was a paid lobbyist for a number of companies. Now, as I actually reported at Open Democracy, I was there at the time that by how Patterson had actually after he'd been in Northern Ireland secretary, very a very unpopular Northern Ireland secretary, probably the most unpopular. After he left office, just after he left office, he rang around loads of companies that he'd met as Northern Ireland secretary and asked, Do you want me to work for you? And a couple of them said yes, and he had these big contracts. He paid hundreds of thousands of pounds a year to lobby for these companies. Then, when the COVID uh, when COVID happened, he was lobbying on behalf of these companies, and this was found. He was found guilty of this. He was uh, he was supposed to be suspended for thirty days from 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 the Commons. And in response, what Boris Johnson did was attempt to to dissolve the Standards Committee and replace it with a new body that, instead of traditionally the Standards Committee led by the opposition, would be led by the government. So it'd be Tory MPs who making the rules on this. And in some ways, it gave me hope because actually that that was actually the start of the end of Boris Johnson. At that stage, he was incredibly riding incredibly high in the polls, huge popularity ratings, and, and actually there was a pushback against him on the back of that. So that was good to see. But it's a, it is worth noting. I was actually um, I'm not read it yet, but I was listening to Chris Bryan talk about his book, the um, uh, Chris Bryan, the Labour MP, is on the Standards Commission. He was uh, he made the point that I think there's been about seventy odd uh, suspensions from the House of Commons over the last in the last hundred years. 23 years, over 20 of them have happened in this parliament, which is just remarkable. And that's the kind of, and it's become, I think we've become slightly inured to this. It's just something that happens. And I think that's really, yeah, it's just, it's something that's really, there's a, there's an aspect where this is, it's, it's really pernicious, but people I think can feel disempowered because it's just, it feels like it's happening all the time. And I think that's why it's so important for politicians and for others like to stand up and say, no, there's something you care about. 
Yeah, definitely. And it, it's not really a hard issue to solve because if you look at the, the challenge, that being some people that have waved into politics that haven't exactly got the, the right ethics and morals and standards around them, we do have things like the Nolan's principles where we could easily articulate that to being the standardization of, of MPs. And if MPs fall short, it's not a 30 day suspension, it's a removal and okay. a by election. And it's, so these things, the, the, there is good to come from all of this chaos and the good comes from the ability to, they, they often go so far that it highlights the solutions right in front of you of how to solve and mitigate some of these challenges. So I do look at things like that and go, well, that's, that's one wave that we could um, solve. I also look at things we, we talked about this trust at the beginning when, when she lost out to a letter, so that was quite comical, but she, she lasted, what, was it 48, 49 days? And she still ended up, her and Boris Johnson still ended up getting what should be known as a dishonorable list, whereby we, we talk about the Institute of Economic Affairs. How many people got pumped into the House of Lords through having a, a small tenure as, a, as, as the PM of this country? And also the ability to, is it 100,000 that she can claim for the rest of her life? Can you? Some of these things just do not make sense. At the time that people are choosing, or well, not choosing, they're being forced between heating and eating. How does this play out when the pandemic was at, was at its peak and there was often that line of this one rule for them and others for everyone else? It's like, this is what we, we, we play at the moment. Like MPs that haven't ever been held accountable because of wrongdoing from, I guess, like the leaders at the top and that filters down. Yeah, I think it's, a, I think that's it. I think there is a kind of the fish rods from the head syndrome to this. And I think there's an aspect in which we have set up a system as well where political parties run on, on private money largely so they have to raise they have to raise private money so that within the process of that you end up asking well who's going to give us money so this we already we've accepted a system where can't where access is sold and so that's on its own actually creates a huge amount of moral hazards anyway even for the, the most honorable of members that's already a massive moral hazard but at the same time exactly we've got a situation um i did an investigation into donors in the house of lords conservative donors particularly party treasurers and discovered that for three, three million pounds is the going rate for a party donor. That is incredible. That is selling seats in the House of Lords in the legislature. That is something that happened. That is something that is just is actually just naked corruption. And we tolerate that. And we tolerate this fiasco where people who happen to work for made Forrest Johnson feel good by telling him nice things for for a couple of months get at the age of twenty nine or whatever it is get put into the House of Lords forever. This is shocking. Absolutely shocking. If it happened in other countries, we would be incredibly critical of it. And I think that's it. I think there's a, there's 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 some things that can be done in terms of known and principles in terms of some aspects of legislation. But I think there's also some quite like quite kind of almost built in systemic issues that we actually would that, that need to be really grappled with and need to be said actually this this is not okay. This is really not okay. And it has to be named as such. It has to be named. As I think the seats in the House of Lords for donors actually has to be named as corruption. I mean, we have to call well, it that. So we can call it that. And then we can talk about other things like second job and say this is problematic for these reasons. And we can then have a, a useful, balanced conversation. But until we do that, I think we're going to, we're going to go around in circles. The word corruption is not is often oh, negated for a softer term called cronyism. And people go, oh, that's just friends and friends and, and, and donors, it's fine. But no, corruption is, is serious. Having previously worked with an audit, looking at rules and regulations throughout the world, the UK is really, really weak when it comes to laws and legislation around corruption. And it's because, back to what we said before, I think there's always been that gentleman agreement, that kind of handshakes, and we'll, we'll do everything above board, but there's no underlying legislation to hold people accountable for their actions. And, and because we don't see the accountability that should take place, we talked about COVID contracts, but if you, first and foremost, if you're getting a huge windfall of, of, of funds through simple connections with political members, then the ability to claw back that money and hold people accountable at the moment. It just looks like Michelle is the only person that they're they're gunning for, but she's one of many. And when, when we start looking at people that have also facilitated this within government, it, you shouldn't be able to claim that parliamentary privilege to avoid scrutiny and, and accountability for your actions. People should be a little bit more harder in respect to what takes place because I honestly don't think that people see the impact of that loss of revenue. So when you look Brexit, for example, is a 4% loss of GDP and people go, 4% it's not much. It's 100 billion. But then when we start seeing things like COVID contracts and the accumulation of that, how much wealth is lost that way, we start then looking, I looked 
today. I think it was um, Rishi Sunak and his wife's relationship with, is it Infose? Infose, yeah. 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 That, that's just insane. Yeah, so, so, you know, I did a story on that recently too. Infosys have, have been put on two big procurement contracts, which potentially they could get a lot of new contracts in the back of. And I think this is where it's interesting, like, you know, that, because we don't have... So Rishi Sunak's wife is... She's very, very wealthy. Rishi Sunak's the wealthiest person to ever be in number 10, by quite a long way. He has a lot of money. And it was interesting when he finally belatedly brought out his tax returns last year, and most of the money came from shares, from dividends from shares in the US. And then he... Um, he paid, he paid an effective tax rate of about 22%, which very few people, nobody earning that, if you, if you earn that much money, if you earn 50 grand a year on PAY, your effective tax rate is a lot higher. And he was a couple of million pounds a year. Um, and his wife, his wife uh, owns, it doesn't sound like much, 0.93% of Infosys. But it's 39 million shares, and her, his wife's share of is worth about 600 million, give or take, uh, pounds at the moment. So that's a big lot of a company. Last year in dividends, she got paid more than thirty million pounds in dividends by Infosys, and and over the last years, Infosys has been getting more and more government contracts. And that's not to say that they're getting the contracts just because Rishi Sunak is there or whatever else. But you are talking about potential conflicts of interest. You are talking about a company that really is now politically incredibly well connected, and also you're talking about a company that will share prices are affected by a company's ability to get government contracts. When countries get government contracts, the share price goes up because of the expectation you would get more contracts. And when you have a shareholder that's worth six hundred million pounds in a company and it's paying dividends of three percent, which is what Infosys pays, you don't have to do the maths and go, actually, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of potential money here. And I think the fact that we're so shy, we shy away from these things so much in this country, we don't talk about them. We kinda of, we kinda of say, Well, actually, where's the evidence of something untoward is happening? And it's like, well, this in some ways the burden of proof shouldn't be proactive. The burden of proof should be in terms of, of, of transparency. The burden of proof and what I was really struck when the readers I wrote the story I wrote about Infosys is that the ethics advisor made a ruling that Sunak doesn't have to declare his wife shareholding on the, minister, on the register of interest, the register of ministerial interest. And I think a lot of people are saying, well, surely he should. And it's all about saying that oh, his wife is different to him. Yes, but obviously they're they're in the same household and she has she's very, very wealthy and it's large amounts of money. And there's large, yeah. there's large potential upside to this uh, for her. And I think we had, as you say, this kind of good chops kind of approach almost in the UK where we don't actually sit back and go is this okay is this not something that we should be thinking about for a much much less much more proactive transparency perspective rather than that kind of well if there's no if there's no active sign of wrongdoing what's the problem yeah definitely and it's that parallel between government and corporations because having spent an awful lot of time auditing within corporations even from a procurement stance it's it's a known hotbed for corruption but then you can mitigate that by putting processes in place like competitive bidding and retaining that documentation so you can actually see the flow through of how decisions were made and it's not a, a lot of people when they talk about things like fixing procurement, it, they say, well, it's it's too much of a burden of process and it's going to slow things down and we need to make decisions quick. It, does, it honestly doesn't take that long. It doesn't take long to document uh, what you've been doing. And I think this lack of documentation, we're seeing it within the, the COVID inquiry at the moment in respect to people's WhatsApp groups and people's WhatsApp mes- messages. And yeah, that, that's that's if you don't have anything to hide, then why hide? I think that's it. We do. We have this kind of system where we don't have the kind of checks and balances that you might have. Like, so we, we don't have an anti-corruption strategy. The UK had an anti-corruption strategy for five years from 2017 to 22. It hasn't been updated. The government has said it will be soon, but it hasn't been really done in, in quote-unquote due course. But what's really striking about it is, is that the anti-corruption, ahead of that strategy, a lot of people in the transparency space, a lot of campaigners and others were calling for political donations and party funding to be brought within that. But we haven't done that at all. So if you are, if you run an art gallery, you have to do money laundering checks on people who come in and buy buy works of art. If you're a political party and someone gives you, so if someone comes into your art gallery with underground and wants to buy something, you have to find out if it's the proceeds of money laundering. If you're a political party and someone can come and give you underground, then all you have to do is do a quick Google to see are they on the electoral register or if it's from a company, does the company register a company house? That's basically it. That's all you have to do. Nothing else. Which is shocking, yeah. really. There's no due diligence done whatsoever on political government funding. And I think it's it's been that way for so long through, back to that like gentleman's handshakes, it's, it's been like that for so long that it's become like an established protocol. But then now, because of the changes and because of the shift in narrative and the shift in direction in respect to where politics is moving, not just in the UK, but globally, 
we need to start having more accountability and more processes and controls in place. Otherwise, we'll get to a point we'll, we won't be able to really, our votes won't count. That's the that's worry that I, I get to is when you ha- have the ability to vote, but then you're able to manipulate a system in such a way that your vote is becomes meaningless. And, and that's like democracies make that horrible slide to autocracies. And you look at it and go, well, actually, how did we get there? And and it's through these, it's it's never really through a, like a boom and bust scenario. It's always just that small, subtle pushing of an envelope day in, day out. And, and over the course of um, duration of time, that compounds into scenarios. You look back and go, how did we get, how did we let our country get to this? And, and that's what I want to kind of see change. This year alone, we're in that hyper cycle of elections. It's, it's known as like the super election year where about two thirds of the world's democracies are having, having elections both now and up until the end of the year. And like, we have an opportunity to, sh- to change the narrative, to kind of articulate a, a world that is more values-based and more optimistic, put a, put, put a nail in the coffin of this carnage that we've seen for the last couple of years throughout the world and, and start to move on from this. But I, I, I do worry people really aren't that uh, a breadth of the issues that, that is truly at hand. People are kind of... It, it's crazy. Some people just aren't up to speed in what's what's taking place in front of their eyes, and I don't know if that's the the thing of maybe just being suppressed by so much carnage and chaos over a long duration of time that they feel tired. I'm not sure what it is, but there is this kind of opposites between people that are really pushing for progressive change and also people that are just tired and fatigued with the last couple of years that's taken place. And I think fatigue can often be like the kind of goal of political campaign. And that, I think that's probably my concern with the election is, is the production of cynicism. And cynicism is such a powerful motivator in authoritarian regimes and in, in the kind of move towards authoritarianism. And I think that's something I definitely kind of feel and, can, and unfortunately definitely can see aspects of in Britain and British politics. Definitely. Hey, we've talked a lot about greed and corruption, the ability to influence. Hopefully we've shed some light on a lot of the topics that are taking place for people to at least consider. I'm not saying that you need to listen to everything, but at least consider the, the discussion that's taken place. But a lot of it has also been about the the challenges. But I guess how do we, in, in your view, in your experience, how do we respond to the rise of the right that we see today? And also what are your key thoughts for the future? It's a really good question. Like, like how do we respond to this? How do you respond for this political moment where you're seeing a lot of a lot of kind of kind of really worrying things in in politics and really worrying things in our politics? I think the information ecosystem is so important. Like where people are getting their information from, the validity of information. It's so quick for mis and disinformation to, to spread. And I think like just like one thing I'm always really conscious of myself of being making sure I'm checking my facts before I'm sharing something, make sure, think, even if it just, if it plays to my biases even more so, making sure I'm checking with my facts. And I think there is a thing about it. It's hard to do as an individual vote, but thinking about politicians, political parties who are, who are trying, who are trying, at least trying to keep some standards, who are trying to talk about things like having reforms of, of, of the way our politics is done. I think that's, all of that is really important. I think it's important in some ways as well, having some hope and not getting think it's, it's easy to feel uh, a, str- a strong tide of negativity in these times, especially around like, the kind of the political structures that we see. I think it's really important not to, on a personal level, I think it's really important to not feel so so breath and so hopeless that you don't see change, you don't see that change is possible. Because in some ways that's the goal of all this, is to make change be like possible. And I think it, it, when you do, when you kind of give into that and feel like, yeah, change is impossible, that's actually winning. That's, that is part of your authoritarian playbook. And I think that's the bit when I look at the future, I think it's so important that so I'm seeing uh, the potential for change. And, 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 and the sense that you see, it, it has been, you know, the kind of the rise of new types of social movement, I think are really interesting. The climate debates brought in a whole new raft of social movement, a whole new way of organizing. I think all of that's, it's, it's still in its infancy probably, but that's all really interesting. Like there is still, it's, it's, it's not as cut and dried. It's not as, as definitive as sometimes it can feel. I think that's probably my kind of slightly panglossy and hope for future. Yep, amazing. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Before we kind of close out, we've just got a few questions from our audience. So the first being, what, one particular person wanted to understand your viewpoints on, on free ports within the UK. I think it's really interesting. I think I, I kind of started looking into free ports a few years ago when the government first came out. It was a bit like, there's been a lot of concerns internationally about free ports. It's kind of money laundering and, and problems, with, not just money laundering, but other aspects of free ports. 
And they kind of don't make much sense in Britain because Britain is actually quite a low tax jurisdiction. So it doesn't be like, Britain's kind of like a big already. So what's going on with it? Yeah, and I think what we've seen from Teesside and Tees, I, I still can't believe there hasn't been a National Audit Invest Office investigation into them. I think it's really concerning what we've seen with Ben Houchin and his mates up in Teesside. Um, Private Eyes done amazing work on it. I've, I've started doing a little bit of digging, I must say, myself into some of the other free ports. I think at the very, at, at the most charitable uh, reading, a free port seems to be not particularly useful policy. At the at the most concerning reading, based on what at least we have from these work, it seems to be there seems to be huge, I think, concerns about what, how they're operating, the, the spend of public money on them, and who's making who's benefiting from these things. Yeah, from the T side perspective, not everybody will be able to speed with it, but if you could maybe give some highlights in respect to that particular case. Well, what effectively you have in T side is a huge transfer of of public assets, particularly land. To a company that was owned, is owned by a couple of people, uh, a huge transfer of funds from public, uh, the purchase of these public assets to the same company, which seems to be connected into Ben Houch and the Conservative mayor of Teesside. A huge concern, like it, it seems as if the public, the public is on the hook for all the potential losses that could accrue at the at Teesside, while it's the private company that has inexplicably been given these contracts and given this huge amount of land for almost no money that's on the uh, that is on the hook for all that, is, that stands to benefit from all the upside so i don't understand is that supposed to be brexit britain where we just have a, a kind of a mass transfer of assets from uh, from the public uh, from the public to the private and somehow that's going to create new wealth i can't say i i see no evidence of that yeah, it's a correlation between. I think it was like ninety-seven pounds that they paid for the for the land, and it's it's valued over a hundred million. So you, you're looking at that, go like you, you just you can't comprehend it. For me, like at the moment as we record this, a lot of people are, are past tense talking about things like the post the postmaster scandal in respect to Horizon due to that absolutely amazing show that was on ITV. But me personally, I'm looking at this and going, well, this is another scandal waiting to waiting to happen, and it feels like it's just simmering away in the background. And I think that you know sooner rather than later, that 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 that'll kind of reveal its realities. And I know at the moment that there's a discussion about going through like an independent review in respect to corruption. But yeah, who who knows? Who knows what's going to happen there? Just the simple maths just don't add up. You, Ninety-seven pounds for a hundred million worth hard worth of land just don't make sense. I'm intrigued to see how that flows out. Another question from our audience was also um, that of what are your viewpoints in respect to how opposition parties counter the the current challenges that we see in, in front of us in respect to the Conservative Party and why they feel the Republicans in the market? I think it's really, I think the one thing I, like from my kind of anti-corruption bailiwick and from things that I'm interested in, I would love to see a unified opposition with a series, you know, not just a recommitment to Nolan principles, but a set of proposals about what we would do. What we would do, like, to end, you know, the Labour Party said, that they would end the House of Lords, but it actually give them very little detail about what that would look like. But a series of actual concrete steps of what we would do to tackle the rot in British politics. I think that would be really important, something I'd love to see. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I could chat to you all day, but I um, yeah, just want to close out and say thank you so, so much for your time. If you want to finish out with any key thoughts and takeaways you want to leave our audience, that'd be amazing. Oh, thank you very much, Peter. It's been lovely to be It's been great to be here. It's great to talk to you. I think, yeah, I guess my, my big takeaway, I think I would kind of make the case for uh, people keeping informed about what's happening people keeping an eye people keeping abreast of what's going on i think journalists like me others in the in the space are all trying to kind of bring these stories to life and the more everyone can do to kind of keep themselves informed about what's happening and support the kind of work that we all do be yeah that's great amazing and how can people get in contact with you if they want to uh, the best place to find me is on substack actually i have my democracy for sale substack so you can subscribe to that and then um, actually, if you respond to the emails on that, you'll actually go straight to my inbox. So I'll see you. Amazing. Thank you so, so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Peter. It's been lovely to hear with you.